All right, guys, it's a rainy Saturday afternoon out here. Uh, I've been sitting on the couch uh, reading Batman comic books, playing a little uh, on the record player, and kind of had a moment there where I was like, um, is it 1982? You know, kind of cracked me up. Had a little, a little nostalgia there. And, uh, of course, I'm going to review, you know, show you a few pickups that I've gotten here and there mostly over the past two months um, a lot of these comics that I picked up were you know maybe a dollar a piece here and there and then I'm also selling comics down at a comic book shop uh, about 15 minutes down the road where I'm getting store credit uh, for you know I took I don't know maybe a hundred books down there and uh, he's selling a dollar a piece and I get store credit so a lot of this stuff was free if you consider it that way you know and uh, so here we go All right, what we got here is Avengers Forever, number six. This gives me the complete 12-issue miniseries, maxi-series. And uh, this came out in 98 <clears throat> by Kurt Busiek, Kurt Busiek and uh, Carlos uh, Pacheco. And, uh, you know, it's actually been a little bit of a tough read. And I'm going to probably do a video with a review on it, just to give you a taste of what that review is going to sound like. Kurt Busiek has written one of the greatest Silver Age Justice League stories ever with the Avengers Forever. You know, great covers, uh, the artwork's really good. What we got here is Blackest Night, number one, if you remember that from a few years ago, uh, 2010. This is a director's cut. And really quick, what is cool about this is everybody gets to talk about their favorite panels to work going into them anybody that worked on the blackest night uh, Jeff Johns, Ivan Rice uh, even the colorist Alex Sinclair and they kind of review what they did and didn't do and how they felt about the panels and stuff the work that went into it um, really good stuff to go more or less issue by issue covering the big highlights and some of the better art um, moving on here you know, it's just really good. All the way to the 12 heroes that came back. And then they have the cover gallery. <coughs> this isn't just the covers and the variant covers for the miniseries. They give you all the crossovers up here too, along the bottom. And the sketch covers. Just some beautiful artwork on this. Crisp, clean. Uh, some really brutal covers. Savage almost. You know, I like The Blackest Night because it's actually more or less a horror movie, you know, is what it really was. So that's kind of cool to have. I have a ton of The uh, Blackest Night, I, but no means do I probably had the whole thing. And then we get the, uh, the script that Jeff Johns wrote for Blackest Night number one so you can see what a comic book script looks like. And Jeff Johns really gives a lot of um, room for the artist to come in and uh, do what they need to do to tell the story. And then... Uh, you know, they have a little section on the action figures, how they molded and sculpted them that were coming out for this whole series. And then we get the uh, sketches for the ideas on uh, the Black Lanterns that popped up in the series. And we get to see characters that weren't used. I have or had Ethan Van Skyver on my Facebook, and he actually would put these on his Facebook page before they were anywhere else. So if you, were, if you had friended him, he would show you the work as he did them. I saw the Superman sketch. Uh, pretty sure this is the one. Yeah, Ethan by Van Skyver. I saw most of these pop up on Facebook before you even heard of Blackest Night. I don't know if he, how, how he got by with that. But, uh, yeah. Unused uh, Metamorpho Blackest Lantern. Blackest Night uh, character there. And uh, just all kinds of great little unseen artwork. And I really enjoy that kind of stuff. Okay, a little breath, fresh of uh, a breath of fresh air here is that the Rocketeer Adventures from IDW, a company that I'm I'm really enjoying. I kind of like I dig what they're doing. These Rocketeer Adventures, this is number one, cover A by Alex Ross. Apparently, they have several covers, and what they're doing is that these are um, three or four, three or four stories in each issue of the Rocketeer, and in the first issue, you know, you got talent like John Cassidy doing the art. In the story, you got Mike McNola coming in, and it says Dave Stewart, you know, doing some pinups. Mike Allred doing a story. Then we got Kurt Busiek with uh, Mike Clute in this first issue. 
And some of this artwork is just wonderful, you know. You know, just keeping it going. These are just simple, fun, lighthearted stories of, um, you know, the Rocketeer. Okay, here's number two, cover B. And this one we have uh, Mark Wade, we have Darwin Cook, we have Jeff Darrow, you know, and Gene Ha coming in and doing some stuff. And I've read this one. This one's really fun. Um, the Rocketeer's girlfriend is based on Betty Page, and she's the super sexy in these. You know, just really good stuff. Really enjoy that. And this is what we call a comic bag with a board. Um, you know, it's kind of stuck in here. These are very important to keep your comics going. Um, hopefully you can get one. Yeah, here we go, number three. I'll flip through this one also. Uh, again, we have Ryan Sook, uh, Bruce Tim plot and art of uh, the Batman cartoon fame. And yeah, Steffi Bushima, you know, but they're just really fun books. I highly recommend them. Alright, I, I, I loathe and hate Booster Gold, but for some reason I'm going to end up getting the first 12 issues of the Jeff John series that came out in 07, um, following uh, 52. Because basically what we have here is Booster Gold number 2. The whole concept of this book is that Booster Gold is a joke, and he's going to be the greatest hero you've never heard of because he is now like the hero that keeps time uh, straight. He, he, he saves people and heroes by fixing time and we never know it so what we have here is a Jeff Johns Green Lantern story that a lot of people don't you know aren't really aware of and in this in this world something had happened to where they were getting told that Guy Gardner would be the greatest Green Lantern ever no Hall Jordan they went in and messed with it a little bit and ended up being Sinestro being the greatest Green Lantern so uh, it kind of ties in with continuity and then I got number three because uh, basically we have Booster Gold in the Wild West with Jonah Hex and I believe Batlash pops up in here. I'm not going to get into who Batlash was, but Batlash is uh, someone I really uh, I enjoy. His, uh, he was not in that many comics. I found him in Crisis on Infinite Earth back in 85. And he was only in a couple of comic books, like maybe six of them in the late 60s, I believe. And he actually kept that fan following just from those few issues. Alright, very happy to find this one. I actually paid $5 for this. Uh, I don't know if it's worth it or not, but I enjoy this. This is Miracle Man number 7 from Eclipse Comics. This is probably around 86, 87. And it's an Alan Moore story. And this is just brutal. This book is just the stuff that goes on in here. Um, I will show you one panel. But basically, this started out as Marvel Man. And you've probably heard of it because of the big uh, lawsuits that's gone over. This was a, a more or less an English version by a uh, creator in the 50s named uh, Mick Angelo or Mike Angelo. And basically it's Captain Marvel. Secret words. Had the whole, uh, their own little Marvel family. So Alan Moore picked it up in the early 80s. And it was being published in a magazine. Um, Warrior, I think. I'm not sure what it was called. But anyway, it came over here to America and then it got kind of continued. And they had to call it Miracle Man because Marvel Comics got all upset about it. And it's just a great series all the way around. So basically, here's your Miracle Man who I think looks like the new Captain Marvel coming out. Blonde hair, look at the outfit. He picks up these two gentlemen after a no an ex-former Nazi is saying that that was, you know, he looks like uh, the Uberman that they all dreamed about. Blonde hair and blue eyed. He's not though. So he picks up these two guys by the chin, and then he, uh, you know, busts their head to where it explodes. So while he's got this glitter around him from his powers and things, and the blood is just splattering down here from these two guys, the uh, over the uh, ex-Nazi here is just can't believe he's finally seen the dream of the Nazis before him. So the man, so he says, "Yes, you can go now," and takes his finger and just pushes it through him. And then it's got another sequence in here that this is the issue that always stood in my mind. We get point of view flying. Miracle Man is, is mad, right? So he floats. You see the tree. The tree explodes. You see the boulder. The boulder explodes. You see the man. He goes towards the man. The man explodes. Just great storytelling.
Now I got these for a buck a piece. I'm, I'm really glad to have these because I actually found them a buck a piece about 10 years ago. Sold them. I've got a trade, but this this is marvelous. You know, the Kurt Busiek, Alex Ross. This is where Alex Ross really you know broke through in the early 90s here. And this is more or less Kurt Busiek writing a love letter retelling the world of, of Marvels, uh, the Marvel Universe, through the eyes of uh, a photographer. And Alex Ross came in. I got all four of these for a dollar a piece. Well worth it. Well preserved. They got there in two bags a piece. And to preserve the art in these, you know, that's the Human Torch by Alex Ross. This really sort of started by Alex Ross wanting to uh, be able to draw a photorealistic picture of the Human Torch. Um, maybe a little bit of a dent there. Looks like the corner's been dented a little bit. It's all right. You know, but it's great stuff. They're full of Easter eggs. Clark Kent and Lois Lane are in here. Popeye in here. First story takes place with the, you know, the, the uh, arrival of the Human Torch in the 30s. And everybody goes to war. And you get to see J. Jonah Jameson and Nick Fury as, as young kids. Okay, and then, you know, we move up to the 60s where the X-Men were coming. And he ties in all the stuff that's going on in the Silver Age universe as it was going along. And then we got issue three, which is just unbelievable. This is the uh, Galactus. This is the arrival of Silver Surfer and Galactus being retold as we see it. And then it ends with what you know a lot of people do consider the end of the Silver Age, which is also up for debate, with the death of Gwen Stacy. And there's a little Watchman Easter egg in here just to say that. But it tied in everything that was going in. They did their research. Kurt Muzak read these books and he tried to do a timeline, and they all go together. And it was how would the everyman, you know, the people in that world, how would they see things? So, you know, if you know your Silver Age comics and Marvel, then you're really going to enjoy how he put it all together. All right, now, like I said, I was reading some Batman books. I got these. Whoops. There's the myth. I got my saga. It's over. Anyway. Finally got to read. I got five, six, seven, and eight of the uh, Batman, the Court of Owls story that's going on. Holy crap. I mean, this is just amazing. The art in it, uh, Batman is walking through a labyrinth, and, and the pages are all set out to where there's no color in them. They're white. And it kind of, you felt like the, the Batman had been walking around in this, this maze that the secret society has trapped him in. He's finding clues and stories of who the Court of Owls are and how they control Gotham. I mean, I'm sure everybody's seen the reviews and I'm catching up. But this is just amazing. Uh, just it just blew my mind. I mean, this is some great storytelling, and this one messed me up because he started playing playing with the page layouts. Okay, we have a normal comic. We have Batman getting beat up and walking through uh, the labyrinth, and then he starts playing with the pages. So you have to turn your comic, turn your comic. I mean, it's just insane. It's, it's you're you're going into this drugged madness or whatever it is that Batman is in, and the pages, you know get a little bit and a little bit more you can still follow the story but you better be paying attention because all of a sudden he makes you flip the comic book over and now you got to read it backwards you know I mean that was just amazing you know and this this Greg Capullo I'm so glad to see him off spawn you know this this artwork is just amazing then you got to flip the book over I mean you just feel crazy this that is that is brilliant. I haven't seen anything like that since um, an issue of Sandman there. <sighs> number six. Number seven. Number eight. This is just fantastic setting up what's going on. The Night of the Owls. Uh, Batman never appears in costume in this, um, which is the first thing, you know, I, I kind of showed. And Batman is rattled, you know. Okay, and of course, it's over with here. I finally got a Saga number one. Got to read it. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to have to read a few more issues to see if I'm really, really on board with this. I kind of like what they're doing. It's the exact... Uh, there's, there's the theme. The themes that are going through this book. This man is just writing... Uh, the man is a writer. Brian K. Vaughn is a writer. And there's some things that I picked up on that I finally, after hearing the reviews and talking about it on some podcasts and everything like that, uh, to finally sit down and read it, I started picking up on things. There's the theme of, 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 of sex. you got two people that love each other, and 
it, it's a really an adult story. And then you also have like the television people having sex. They they come off sort of sweet the way they talk to each other and everything like that. And then you got these other people who were really coming off kind of like hardcore and you know kind of shallow, just not it's just not working. So he's exploring a whole lot more than what everybody else, you know, than what I've, I've heard other people pick up on. So I think after reading three, four issues of this, um, I think we're just, you know, he's just having a blast. He, Brian K. Vaughn just feels like he's having a blast writing this. Constant Brom star on his channel or on a podcast or something, he put it perfectly. There's, you know, there's no other way to really put it. He says it feels like 70s heavy metal uh, magazine kind of story and he's absolutely right so Saga gets a thumbs up it's good to, you know all I have to do now is find the Mothman and the Bigfoot and the three big urban legends around here are solved okay before I go here uh, I want to throw a shout out to who I'm going to call the uh, British Invasion Boys um, we got three guys there that I've been watching their videos and, and two of them I really really think that a lot of people are missing out not watching their videos not getting another personality. One's just started up. One's been doing this a couple months, and we all know Ghost Critic. So Ghost Critic, you get the first shout out. Check out Ghost Critic's channel. Type in Ghost Critic, you will find him. Second one is M A W, O O One. I like this guy's videos. I like his sense of humor. Uh, you watch his stuff. You're just it just feels like you're you're sitting in his his and I mean this lovingly messy apartment with him, just looking at comics, shooting the breeze and stuff. Or just I really enjoy his videos, and I say check him out. And then we got a, a, a new in, a new one who's just got it starting up. Um, it is Dragon Heart Collectible. Uh, Dragon, oh no, Dragon Heart Collect is what I think his uh, channel is. I'll put some links down there. Check his stuff out. He's just getting in there. So you know, let's give the guys you know over the Atlantic here that make the effort to get these comics and and you know absorb you know this stuff and, and throw it back at us with their point of view and making their videos and they stay up late you know eight hour difference from where I'm at they stay up late doing this stuff and hanging out and and they just really enjoy what they're doing so check them out and I'll throw some links on alright guys later <laughs>